bless you. Good morning, everyone. All right, you are the few, the proud, the brave. You're the ones who made it through the slow, through the snow. Uh, congratulate yourselves. Give yourselves a hand this morning for making it here today. <clears throat> Thank you for joining us, and welcome to everyone who's watching by live stream this morning. If you have your Bibles, I want to invite you to turn with me to the book of First Corinthians, chapter eleven. First Corinthians chapter 11, I want to share a word with you today about how to dress for church, how to dress for church. First Corinthians chapter 11, while you find your way there, just a couple of quick announcements for you. First of all, I want to remind you that our annual report is coming up on a Wednesday evening in March, on March 18th. Mark your calendars, and I hope you'll plan to be with us once a year. Our board of deacons and trustees and our pastors present to the congregation uh, all the financial reports from the previous year, showing everything that was received by our congregation, how it was allocated, and uh, bring a report of the ministry to you. It's a wonderful time together. We'll be selecting two new deacons to serve on our board of deacons and trustees that evening. So we hope you'll join us on Wednesday evening, March 18th at 7 p.m. for that meeting. And then just want to let you know that we are uh, getting ready for the Good Friday worship celebration on Friday evening, April the 3rd. Uh, we have a great choir this year. We have a great uh, children's choir that's coming together. And uh, we want to fill up the Palace Theater on Good Friday evening, April 3rd. Uh, and I want you to just begin praying now about who you might bring with you to the Palace Theater in Stanford, uh, a, a neighbor, a family member, a coworker, a friend. Uh, it's going to be a great night where we just focus especially on sharing the gospel, the truth of the cross, and what it accomplished for us. And so I hope you'll be in prayer with us, and I hope you'll make plans to join us. And then I just want to say thank you for your patience as you navigate around the property uh, with our construction going on. Uh, this week we are scheduled, weather permitting, to start dismantling the canopy over the main front entrance, and we will be closing down the front door uh, so that we can excavate in front of it because that's where the new building is going to connect with this building. So most likely when you come next Sunday, you won't come through the main front door. You'll come through these French doors right here under this temporary porch. And uh, just watch out for the signs. Uh, please use care as you travel around the property uh, with changing traffic patterns. And we want to thank you for your prayers. Um, I want to tell you that the Lord is really helping us. We are making out extremely well. Um, with the excavation, we've been able to redesign the foundation, saving really many hundreds of thousands of dollars. And uh, the Lord is just with us. And thank you for your prayers. Thank you for all of your giving. Thank you for anything you can share right now towards your jump in pledge and towards our phase two facility. Uh, we appreciate it. We're moving forward. All right, look with me in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. I'm going to begin reading in verse 2, and we want to talk for a few minutes about how to dress for church. 1 Corinthians 11, beginning in verse 2. Paul says, I praise you for remembering me in everything and for holding to the traditions just as I pass them on to you. But I want you to realize that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of every woman is man, and the head of Christ is God. Every man who prays or prophesies with his head covered dishonors his head. Actually, it's kind of an interesting thing, but in the Greek text, it actually where it says head covered, in the Greek text, it talks about a man's hair hanging down or long hair on a man. But every woman who prays or prophesies with her head uncovered dishonors her head. It is the same as having her head shaved. For if a woman does not cover her head, she might as well have her hair cut off. But if it is, is a disgrace for a woman to have her hair cut off or her head shaved, then she should cover her head. A man ought not to cover his head, since he is the image and glory of God, but woman is the glory of man. For man did not come from woman, but woman came from man. Neither was man created for woman, but woman for man. It is for this reason that a woman ought to have authority over her head because of the angels. Verse 10 is one of the very interesting verses in the entire New Testament. Your translation might say a woman ought to have a sign of authority or a symbol of authority over her head. That's not what the Greek text says. The NIV translation, the most recent NIV, NIV translation, actually accurately portrays the Greek text where it says she ought to have authority over her own head because of the angels, and we'll talk about that. 
Nevertheless, in the Lord, woman is not independent of man, nor is man independent of woman. For as woman came from man, so also man is born of woman, but everything comes from God. Judge for yourselves. Is it proper for a woman to pray to God with her head uncovered? Does not the very nature of things teach you that if a man has long hair, it's a disgrace to him, but that if a woman has long hair, it is her glory? For long hair is given to her as a covering. If anyone wants to be contentious about this, we have no other practice, nor do the churches of God. Now, just very quickly, jump over with me to chapter 14, and there's just two little troublesome verses there that I want to put to rest this morning. If you look with me in 1 Corinthians 14, and quickly find verse 34, if you would. 1 Corinthians 14 and verse 34. If you're there, it says, Women should remain silent in the churches. They're not allowed to speak, but must be in submission, as the law says. If they want to inquire about something, they should ask their own husbands at home, for it is, it is disgraceful for a woman to speak in the church. We're going to talk about those verses and shed a little light on them today. Let's pray and ask the Holy Spirit to come minister to us. Father, thank you for this morning. And Father, we thank you that the fresh fallen snow reminds us, Lord, that you have washed us whiter than snow by the blood of Jesus. Father, thank you for everyone who has come to be with us today. Thank you for everyone who's joining via live stream. Holy Spirit, I pray that you'd come into this place. I pray that you'd come into the rooms of every person attending online. And Father, I pray that you'd minister to us. I pray we would encounter you as we share your word. If you agree with that, just say amen and amen. Well, how did you choose what to wear to church today? And when did you decide what you were going to wear? Did you lay something out last night? Did you wash something? Did you iron something last night? Did you grab something out of the closet this morning and give it the smell test? <laughs> did your wife lay something out for you? Did your mom lay something out for you? Did you fight with your mom about what you were going to wear to church today? Did you ask your husband if that outfit makes you look fat? And husbands, did you fall for that? <laughs> did you decide what to wear after you watched the weather? Did you wear something to mark a special occasion today? I, I saw all the couples last week with your cute little matching red sweaters. You're, you're cute. Did you dress for comfort? Did you dress to impress someone? Did you dress practically because you're serving in a ministry today? Did you dress out of a sense of duty to tradition? Maybe as you got dressed, you heard your mother's voice in the back of your head telling you that you ought to wear a dress or you ought to wear a skirt to church. Did you wear a jacket this morning when you really would have much rather put on a flannel shirt? Did you have a fashion crisis this morning and try on half of everything you own and pile it all up on the bed and now you got to fold it when you get home? You know, not so long ago, dressing up for church was a very big deal. But now there is a very wide spectrum of styles that are all acceptable. The CEOs of multi-billion dollar companies stand up and make public announcements in jeans and black t-shirts. A while back ago, a group of female college athletes made a big stir when they greeted the president in glitzy flip-flops. Of the four largest churches in America, one pastor preaches in a Hawaiian shirt and jeans, one pastor preaches in very expensive custom-tailored suits, one pastor preaches in a polo shirt and khakis, and one pastor preaches in jackets and button-down shirts. And they all preach to many tens of thousands of people every week. The dress code has become very fluid these days, and that's perfectly okay, but it does force us to work a little harder to understand passages like 1 Corinthians 11. Right now, we're reading through this letter of Paul to the Christians in the Greek city of Corinth, and we've discovered that this is no ordinary letter. It is a letter from heaven. It's a letter inspired by the Holy Spirit to speak across time and distance to you and to me. 1 Corinthians 11 deals with a very big issue back then that is mostly extinct for us today, women's hairstyles. Some women in the Corinthian church were doing something with their hair that was considered immodest in the prevailing culture. 
The traditional view is that they were refusing to wear veils on their head, but more than likely, it's actually that they were wearing their hair down in public, which was considered very immodest. In ancient times, a woman only let her hair down in the presence of her husband. To let down her hair in public would be tantamount to disrobing for us. That's why Simon the Pharisee was so disgusted when the forgiven woman showed up in his dining room and she washed Jesus' feet with her tears and then she let down her hair and dried his feet. That was an act of public indecency. But you know, it's not really an issue for us today. Women wear their hair in many different styles. They wear it short, they wear it long, they wear it curly, they wear it straight, they wear it bleached, they wear it dyed, they wear it en naturel. And mostly none of that is immodest to us. Nevertheless, I want to tell you that there are some timeless principles in these verses that still give us guidance today. And there are truths that speak directly to one of the most difficult issues that we're facing in the American church today. So looking at these verses, I see some truths about how to dress for church, and I want to share them with you quickly this morning. How to dress for church. How should you dress for church? First of all, come dressed in holy expectation. Come dressed in holy expectation. The verses that we read in 1 Corinthians 11 and the few that we read in chapter 14 are some of the most misunderstood verses in the whole New Testament. They have been the source of tremendous division. They have been the source of wrongful suppression of women in the church. Beloved, here's what these verses do not say. They do not say that women are inferior to men nor subservient to men, either in the church or anywhere. However, husbands and wives do have a special relationship of mutual honor and submission with one another. These verses do not say that women cannot be leaders in the church. They do not say that women cannot speak in the church. They do not say that women must wear veils in the church for any reason. Here's what these verses do say. They do say that God has created men and women distinct from one another, each with their own place of dignity, and that our manner of dress and our manner of behavior should not blur those distinctions. These verses do say that men and women are equal in Christ and they are interdependent upon one another. These verses do say that both men and women will be used by God to speak during spirit-filled church services. They do say that women should not jettison their femininity in order to prove that they are equal to men. And these verses do say something important about the attitudes of our heart when we come for worship. For one thing, we should come dressed in holy expectation. We should come expecting the Lord Jesus to be palpably present. In chapter 5, Paul said, When you gather together, the Lord Jesus is there with you. Do you know Jesus is in this room today? His presence is here with us. Jesus himself said, when you come together in my name, even if it's just two or three or four or more, when you come together, when you dust off your car, when you come through the slush, when you come together in my name, I am there with you. Amen. You know, we experience God's presence with us every day. But when we're gathered together for worship, we experience his presence in a whole nother dimension. The Bible says that he abides in the praises of his people. And beloved, when Jesus is present, he does the same beautiful things that he has always does. When Jesus is present, he forgives sins. When Jesus is present, he relieves the guilty. When Jesus is present, he restores the broken. When Jesus is present, he refreshes the weary. When Jesus is present, he heals sick bodies. When Jesus is present, he delivers the oppressed. That's why we came today, isn't it? 
That's why, we, that's why we made the effort to be here on a snowy Sunday morning. We came because we knew he would be here. And because he is here, anything is possible. Along with the Lord Jesus, we should come expecting angels to be present. Verse 10 is one of the very interesting verses in the New Testament. Paul says that a woman ought to prudently exercise authority over her own head because of the angels. Women's attire in church should never be immodest. It should never blur the distinction between sexes that God has established in the creation because angels are present in the worship service. And angels are always in perfect order under the leadership of the Lord Jesus Christ. It would shock angels. It would embarrass angels for any of us to behave in a way that is out of order. Beloved, can I tell you, there is so much more to our gathering today than the number of bodies that are in this room. Each one of us who belong to the Lord Jesus came in here with an angel today. Jesus said even the very least person in the kingdom of heaven has an angel assigned to him whose face is always fixed on the Father, waiting for the Father to give the signal for that angel to come to aid and intervene. In addition to the angels that you brought with you this morning, there are angels that God has assigned specifically to Harvest Time Church. In addition to that, there are angels that God has dispatched especially to be present in this service right now. Angels are here to enhance our worship. Angels are here to do spiritual warfare and secure the perimeter around us. Angels are here to neutralize the enemy. Angels are here to bring us messages from God. They're here to bring divine provision. They're here to minister strength and refreshing and healing to us. The presence of angels has a positive effect on the atmosphere. The writer of Hebrews talks about it. He says, when we gather together for worship, we are spiritually transported into the very atmosphere of heaven, the new Jerusalem, where thousands and thousands of angels meet in joyful assembly. And since this is such a special atmosphere, let's be sure not to conduct ourselves in a way that might embarrass the angels. Let's be sure that you don't make your angel do a face palm this morning. How should we come? We should also come expecting spiritual authority to be present, to dispatch miracles and affect outcomes on the earth. Paul talks about it in chapter 5. He says, when we come together for worship, there is power and authority to get things done. You know, the Bible not only says he abides in our praises, but the Bible also says that he is enthroned upon our praises. In other words, where God's people are gathered worshiping, his authority is present. Beloved, listen to me. When we gather together, our worship is powerful. Our prayers are powerful. Our prophetic utterances are powerful. Our proclamation of the gospel is powerful. We can do business together in here, and God can dispatch an answer somewhere out there. You know, of all the people in Israel... Jesus found that a Roman centurion understood that principle better than anyone. The centurion said to Jesus, Jesus, I recognize who you are. All you have to do is say the word and immediately the father will dispatch a messenger with the answer to that prayer. Only say the word and my servant will be healed. Beloved, can I tell you that that kind of authority is present in this room this morning because we have gathered together in the mighty name of Jesus. That's a good preaching right there. I'm going to preach myself happy. <laughs> Along with spiritual authority, we should come expecting the gifts of the Holy Spirit to be in operation, including spirit-inspired prayers and prophecy. In the opening verses of this letter, Paul said that we have been blessed with every good spiritual gift while we wait for Jesus to come again. 
We're going to talk coming right up about the gifts of the Holy Spirit in the next few weeks. But the gifts of the Holy Spirit are to release blessings upon us. The gifts of the Holy Spirit in operation encourage us. The gifts of the Holy Spirit make us inwardly stronger. The gifts of the Holy Spirit minister God's joy to us. The gifts of the Holy Spirit push us forward in the Lord. And the Holy Spirit is here today to minister to each one of us and to his body through these gifts. On top of all of this, we should come expecting to be used by God to bless others in the body. Beloved, listen to me. We, we shouldn't come expecting to be mere spectators or even recipients of gifts of healing or prophecy, as good as that is. But we should come expecting to be ministers of the gifts of the Spirit, both men and women. We're going to get there in a week or two, but in the coming chapters, Paul says, when you come together, each one of you has something to offer, both men and women. Now, here's why the verses that we read in chapter 14 cannot mean that women should never speak in the church. It's because right here in chapter 11, Paul gives instructions to women anticipating that they will be used in spirit-inspired prayer and in spirit-inspired speech. Actually, if we take a quick walk through the New Testament, we'll find that there were women ministering in every one of the five-fold offices of the church in the New Testament. We can read in Romans about a woman named Junia. She was a leader in the church in Rome together with her husband. Quite possibly they were the founding pastors of the church in Rome. And Paul calls Junia and her husband outstanding among the apostles. From the day of Pentecost onward, women were used in the gift of prophecy. In the New Testament church, Philip had four daughters who were recognized by the church as being prophets. Iodia and Syntyche were Paul's fellow workers in the ministry of evangelism. Phoebe was the leader of the church in Centre and a traveling minister of the gospel. She traveled to minister in Rome and probably carried Paul's letter to the Roman church with her. The early church fathers wrote about Phoebe that she traveled widely spreading the gospel. Priscilla and Aquila were a husband and wife team with a pastoral and a teaching ministry. The fact that Priscilla's name is mentioned first almost every time is a pretty good indicator that she was actually the lead minister in that dynamic duo. There were also several women who hosted churches in their homes and served as the pastors of those house churches. Mary, the mother of John Mark in Jerusalem, Lydia and Aphia in Philippi, Nympha in Colossae, and Chloe in Corinth. John's second letter is addressed to a woman who pastored a church in her home. Church history says that her name was Electa, a woman from Babylon. Peter mentions her as well. Paul mentions several other women who he calls his co-laborers and fellow ministers, Tryphena, Tryphosa, Persis, Julia, Acts also mentions Dorcas in Joppa. Here in verse 11, Paul says, in the Lord, woman is not independent of man, nor is man independent of women. He says the same thought in Galatians when he says there is no male nor female in Christ. So how should we come dressed for church? We should come expecting God to move in our midst and we should come expecting to be used, all of us, both men and women. How should you dress for church? Come dressed in holy expectation. A second thing I find, come dressed in reverence. Come dressed in reverence. When we come together for worship, if the atmosphere of heaven is here, if angels are here, if the Lord Jesus himself is here, then we ought to come in with reverence. If the authority of the Lord is here to dispatch miracles, if the gifts of the Holy Spirit are here to bless us all, then we ought to conduct ourselves with reverence. Some of the Corinthian women were being irreverent with their attire and their behavior. 
the way that they were wearing their hair, whether it was that they didn't have a veil or whether it was that they were wearing it long, whatever it was they were doing, it was culturally immodest. And that created a distraction that drew attention away from the Lord. Paul says they were embarrassing themselves, they were embarrassing the men, they were embarrassing the angels, and ultimately they were dishonoring Christ and the Father from whom all things come. I guess that there's a lot that we could say about reverence, but let me just throw two quick things at you. First of all, I find that reverence is to focus on the Lord. Beloved, when we gather together, the goal is not to be entertained. The goal is to engage him. The goal of our worship is to present an offering to him through which we encounter his beautiful presence. The goal of the word is to encounter his revelation truth, which transforms our inner man, which transforms our mind and our being. The goal of coming to the altar is to seal from the Holy Spirit the work that God has done in our hearts. Reverence is fighting the temptation for my mind to wander. Reverence is the refusal to be a spectator or even worse, a critic. Reverence is taking charge of my body and my mind and my will to focus on him. Reverence is being an active worshiper and an active listener and participant. Second, reverence is to avoid creating a distraction to others. Given what Paul says in chapter 11 about women praying and prophesying in the church and given what the rest of the New Testament says about women being apostles and prophets and evangelists and pastors and teachers, we know that these verses in chapter 14 cannot mean that a woman should never speak in church. Rather, Paul was addressing a very specific situation. Some of the women were what we might call noisy learners. Noisy learners process material by verbalizing. Noisy learners like to ask lots of questions. Noisy learners like to repeat out loud what they've heard. Noisy learners like to have side conversations with people around them about what they're discussing and about what they're learning. The women had some catching up to do when it came to biblical literacy. You see, before coming to Christ, they weren't permitted to learn the Torah. So the women had lots of questions. But Paul says that they should ask their questions after the service rather than creating a distraction during the service. And from that unique situation, we can draw a universal principle. Be reverent. Don't create distractions in the worship service. You know, that's one of the reasons why we ask parents to remove fussy babies from the sanctuary. It's not that we're anti-baby. My wife and I have three of them. We're very fond of our babies and of your babies. We're not anti-baby, but we are pro-reverence. Reverence involves coming in for worship on time to the best of your ability when you don't have to brush six inches of snow off your car and not coming in and out of the sanctuary unless it's absolutely necessary. You know, I've been in Avery Fisher Hall with 2,700 people around me and between movements, you can literally hear a pin drop. I've been in Arthur Ashe Stadium with 22,000 other people, and when Serena is about to serve, you could literally hear a pin drop. And if we can show that much deference to musicians and to athletes, how much more reverence do we owe the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords? And that's good preaching right there. How should you dress for church? Come dressed in holy expectation. Come dressed in reverence. And third, come dressed in love and respect for others. Some of the Corinthian women were asserting their individual rights at the expense of the rest of the congregation. They wanted to give expression to their newfound status, to their newfound authority in Christ. Do you understand what Christianity brought to the world was something absolutely uh, socially 
uh, radical and transforming the equality of women. Can I tell you, it is only where Christianity has spread its influence in the world where you find this sense of equality between men and women. And the women were so excited about that, they wanted to give expression to it. And to prove they were equal to men, they broke with the customs of the day for modesty. They let down their hair and they let it fly around while they worshiped in tongues and prophesied. Interestingly, in the pagan temples, women did the same thing when they were in a state of ecstatic frenzy worshiping pagan gods. And Paul says to them, my sisters, you're embarrassing yourselves. You're embarrassing the men. You're embarrassing the angels and you're dishonoring the Lord. From this, we can draw several principles about how we ought to come to church. First of all, we really ought to come dressed modestly. Don't wear clothing to church that draws attention to yourself and takes attention away from the Lord. I see what some of you, I see the selfies that some of you put up on Facebook. Don't come to dress to church like that, all right? And take down the selfie off Facebook. Paul says here that part of dressing modestly is dressing gender appropriately. Men should look like men and women should look like women. Paul says that neither, listen, neither effeminate men nor mannish women can be spokesmen for the Lord. You see, you can't represent God and speak for him if you're living in defiance of his created order of male and female. And that speaks directly to one of the biggest challenges in the church today. But that's good truth right here from the Word of God from 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Come dressed modestly and second, come in humility. Don't behave in such a way that calls attention to yourself. But behave in a way that directs all glory and honor to God. You know, we started this journey teaching through the New Testament in 2010. On the first Sunday of 2010, as I stood up from my seat to walk to the pulpit, the Holy Spirit spoke to me. And he said to me, Glenn, when people leave here today, do you want them to say, what a wonderful preacher Glenn Harvison is? Or do you want them to walk away saying, what a wonderful savior? Jesus is. I have to tell you, after 20 years of preaching, the Holy Spirit challenged the motives of my heart in a way that just pinned my ears back. When you come to worship, do you want to be noticed? Do you hope that people will notice how spiritual you are? Do you hope that they might notice how gifted you are? If so, you are in Corinthian error. I've been in Pentecost for 40 years. I've pretty much seen it all by now, but every once in a while, I still get shocked. A while back ago, we had someone who wanted to be seen during worship. She kept insisting that we let her up on the platform to play the tambourine along with the worship team, even though she wasn't a musician. And when we kept refusing her request, she finally showed up with a small stepladder. And she stood up on the stepladder so that everybody in the congregation could see her just a little head and shoulders above everyone else. Beloved, I have to tell you, antics like that are not worship at all. That is self-promotion. It's asserting one's individual rights at the expense of the rest of the body, and that is Corinthian error. Came across a story this past week where a tambourine player got out of control at a church service in Oklahoma. When the ushers tried to remove her from the service, she got a little wild, and so an off-duty sheriff that happened to be in the service tased her. <laughs> My friend Giancarlo Ochoa had the best line of the week. He said, that gives new meaning to the words, my praise is a weapon. <laughs> I asked the board Thursday night if we could buy Lenny and the ushers a taser. They said, no, we can't do that. <laughs> but, but what a difference. What a difference when one person wants to be seen, but, but there's another person whose heart is so full of love for the Lord 
that in spite of feeling self-conscious, he or she just has to step out into the aisle and express praise to God. That is worship in spirit and truth that God is looking for. I have to tell you the truth. I wish you all would come down to the front to worship. I wish you all would make a joyful noise to the Lord. I wish you all would lift up holy hands. I wish you all would make a wave offering to the Lord. I wish you all would dance like David and let your delight in the Lord carry you out of your comfort zone. I wish you all would sing in the spirit. I wish you all would prophesy. I'm determined to make more room for that in our services. We're going to make more room for that in phase two, but we're going to start and make more room for that right here and right now. But let's make sure that we worship in such a way that when people leave this place, they say, what a wonderful Savior Jesus is. Come dress modestly, come in humility, and come in peace. Paul says in verse 16 that some people are just committed to being contentious. They don't want to submit to the authority of the house. They don't want to relinquish their individual rights for the sake of the body. They actually enjoy creating a little tempest in a teacup. They, they feel that they're titled to, entitled to a special exception. And Paul says it doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way here, and it doesn't work that way in any of God's churches. Don't be a Corinthian woman. Don't insist on your individual rights. Don't resist the authority of apostles and pastors and teachers. Instead, come in peace. Come to be a blessing and not a burden. Come to contribute and not control. Come to support and not show off. How should you dress for church? You doing all right this morning? All right, because here's my last thing. How should you come dressed for church? Come with holy expectation. Come dressed in reverence. Come dressed in love and respect for others. And finally, come dressed in solidarity with the worldwide family of God. Paul appeals on several different bases for the Corinthian women to change their behavior. He appeals on the basis of God's created order. He appeals on the basis of what is culturally modest. And he appeals on the basis of what is customary in all of the other apostolic churches. The Corinthians had a problem. They thought that they were spiritually superior to other churches, and so they thought they were entitled to do whatever they pleased. And so Paul has to remind them over and over again in this letter that they are part of something much bigger than their local assembly. And beloved, we have to remember that too. When we come together for worship, our gatherings are much bigger than the number of bodies in this room. And we're contributing to something much bigger than just this local assembly. You see, when we walk away from here today, it's not only about what God did at harvest time today, but it's how the kingdom of God was advanced all over the earth because we met here today. Beloved, listen to me. The gospel was advanced on earth today because we met here today. The name of Christ was glorified on the earth because we met here today. The church around the world was strengthened because we met here today. Miracles were dispatched somewhere on the earth because we met here today. Imagine what would happen if we came to church every week dressed with that sense of mission and purpose. Beyond the growth of this local body, beyond the construction of a new building, beyond the content of today's sermon, our gatherings have far-reaching consequences on the earth. See, if you come to church with such a conviction in your heart, you will never be bored. You'll never feel like the meeting is pointless, even in seasons when perhaps our congregation isn't making headway as much as we'd like to see. You have a sense of mission that I am part of something that is so much bigger than what I just see right here in front of me. Amen. 
today I want to finish our service by giving a practical expression to some of these truths that we've talked about. Our general superintendent, George Wood, has asked that all of our assemblies pray today for the persecuted church around the world. Actually, the heads of all the Pentecostal denominations, the Foursquare, the Holiness Church, the Church of God in Christ, the Church of God, they all met together this last week and they put out a, a special announcement to all the churches across America to pray today for the suffering church. Our hearts were broken looking at the images of the 21 Egyptian men who were martyred for the sake of Christ this past week. They died calling on the name of Jesus. And looking at those images, I, I couldn't watch any video, just the images before they were martyred. And my prayer to God this week has been that we will be faithful over here while our brothers and sisters are laying down their lives over there. See, one day we're all going to stand together in front of him to receive a reward for the things that we've done in his service. And when we stand in front of the Lord, we're going to be standing side by side with martyrs. And how will we answer the Lord if we wasted our time on frivolous controversies while others on the other side of the world were shedding their blood for his namesake? But you know, there is something powerful that we can do in this place this morning, and that's to pray. When Peter was on death row, the church gathered in the upper room at Mary's house, and they prayed all night. And their prayers brought peace to Peter. In fact, the night before Peter was to be sentenced, he was in such a deep sleep that an angel appeared in his cell and the angel had to kick him a few times to get him to wake up because he was in that deep of a slumber. Who sleeps like that the night before they take your head off? Their prayers dispatched angels to come to Peter's aid. Their prayers resulted in Peter's deliverance from King Herod and an open door to the city. And beloved, I want to tell you that our prayers in this place can do the same. Jesus is here with us this morning. Angels are here with us this morning. The authority of the Lord is here with us this morning. The gifts of the Holy Spirit are here with us this morning. Our prayers are not little. They are powerful. They are effective. And our prayers can dispatch peace to our suffering brothers and sisters on the other side of the world world. Our prayers can dispatch ministering angels. Our prayers can result in the rescue of some and the salvation of others.